at what point do things we possess begin to possess us? Do we imbue our items with fragments of our own souls, or do they pick up hitchhiker spirits seeking a vessel to connect in order to make a connection with the living? We'll explore this topic and hear from Satori and Cody from the Paranormal Couples Haunted Museum to share some spooky tales of some of their most notorious artifacts. Then Karen Dahlman joins me to discuss a different aspect of the Ouija. Does it contain spirits from the minute it's created? Do they affix themselves once a session has begun? Or is there an element of us that we ascribe to the Ouija that is more a sliver of our personality than it is something paranormal? Ghosts of possessions is our topic, and the playground of the paranormal, our theater. All that, plus medium Sarah Lemos from Travel Channel's Ghost Town Terror joins us for upon further review, to go back in time and review Stephen King's movie, Needful Things. So please, come in, take a seat, and let the entertainment begin. That's all next, right here on The Best in Paranormal Podcasting. This is the Paranormal 60 with Dave Schrader. I'm not gonna stand here and listen to this baloney. He won't know. He doesn't stand for baloney. Cody Ray Despians and Satori Hawes are paranormal investigators and researchers with the Atlantic Paranormal Society, TAPS, which was founded by Satori's father, Jason Hawes, in 1990. After working together on a few TAPS cases, they found that they had a connection to each other like no other. And Cody and Satori found that when they are together, and only together, it seems that they have the ability to open a door to intelligently communicate with the other side. What makes their communication different than psychics or mediums is that the intelligent communication can be heard by others as well. This ability has enabled both of them to gain a better understanding of the other side and to help bring messages to those who need it most. Cody and Satori are also the curators of the Paranormal Couples Haunted Museum of Objects, Oddities, and Curiosities. What started out as a few reportedly haunted items from clients grew into a large collection of objects from around the world. As Cody and Satori's names became more known to the public, their haunted collection began to expand. Today, the paranormal couple has dedicated their time and care to those in need, both living and the dead. Welcome to the Paranormal Couples Haunted Museum of Objects, Oddities, and Curiosities. Curated by the paranormal couple themselves, Cody Ray Despian and Satori Hawes. This unique traveling exhibition visits haunted locations and conventions around the United States and features up to 150 presumed haunted artifacts from the museum. These objects have been hand-selected by Cody and Satori themselves due to their intriguing yet eerie spooky stories. Come view items from around the world, including tribal artifacts, occult items, true crime memorabilia, haunted dolls, clowns, and so much more. If you're a fan of the paranormal or history in general, then there's something here for you. For more information on the museum and upcoming events, be sure to visit us at ParanormalCouple.com and follow us on Facebook at The Paranormal Couple's Haunted Museum. All right, it's time to bring them aboard. Cody, Ray, and Satori, welcome to the Paranormal 60. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks for having us, Dave. We're, we're excited to uh, share some spooky stories with you. Yes, we are. 
Well, Satori, I think, I think, uh, you were like, uh, three weeks old when I first met your dad about 20 years ago, it seems like, uh, how the <laughs> hell, how the hell did time move that quickly? That's now you're out there doing this. Is it weird for your dad? Do you ever talk to him about that? You're like, dad, does it feel weird that like now I'm part of the team? Honestly, I think he wasn't expecting me to be as full throttle into it. Um, mm -hmm. I, he doesn't really talk about it too much. He's just more like, hey, I'm passing it on to you. Take with it and do what you will, you know, even if it's a different path than the one I've taken. Um, so I don't know. Maybe it's a little weird for him, but it's something I've just always grown up with. So I think it's something that I was meant to do. It's very cool. And Cody, what kind of pickup line is it that, hey, baby, when we're together, we seem to be able to raise the dead. Was that really how you won her over? Or did you guys just le legitimately find that out through the course of time? Uh, yeah, it, it definitely happened by accident. Uh, she, <laughs> I was I was a part of the team a few years before she wanted to uh, join the team officially. And uh, the first case I found out she wanted to come on, I had gotten word and I sent her a message. I said, hey, I'm Cody uh, from the team. I'm heading in your direction. I'll pick you up on the way. And uh, he didn't, it was an hour off route. He lied, but you know, that's how wow. we first met. So <laughs> the rest is history. Yeah. He just went a little out of his way right on the way. That's it all makes yeah. sense. Yeah. It's never bad to suck up to the boss's daughter. Right. I mean, that's a good way to get into this thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get talking about this haunted museum and, and items, uh, th these haunted and possessed items i've had people drop them off to me now for 17 years at live events sometimes i just found little paper bags balled up and left on my table when i go to lunch at a conference and i come back to find that i'm now the owner of some creepy thing and i was watching your your social media the other day and i noticed you posted this there was a little note with the paper bag that said good luck your problem now tell me yeah. a little bit about what this is and what you guys uncovered yeah, so we actually had this package show up at our door, which is strange because usually we give, you know, a location away from our home right. to drop off a package. And there was no return address. It was dropped off by a mail person. And inside that note was there. And uh, we didn't tell anybody right away, but we're going to tell you now that inside there were a couple of dolls. All were blonde in different, like some of them didn't have clothing. Some of them did. Um, they were all very much covered in dirt, like they were buried and undug. And uh, there was no information as to what's going on with the items, the claims. So it kind of made us a little worried as to what's going on, because we like to know before we take them in. So we better know how to care yeah. for them. But mm -hmm. we haven't really, I think we got a message back recently. Yeah, we, we did get an email. Uh, I think it was yesterday or the day before. From Still no someone. claims, though. Um, just uh, an anonymous email, a uh, fake email address uh, with somebody saying, you know, it was me. This isn't a prank. Uh, you know, they described been, it was in it. Yeah, they described what was in the box and uh, and, you know, just said, you know, I was very frantic when I was packing up uh, the box, putting everything in it. I was really in a tough place. This was a final straw. And I wrote that quick to get him out of the house. And, uh, now I'm, I'm doing okay. And, uh, so we hope we get more details because, you know, every object we have has a case file and it's hard to build a case file off nothing, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Richard Steele says your problem now doesn't sound friendly. That doesn't sound <laughs> like something you just want to send to him. And you guys know enough, uh, obviously with uncle Johnny's office, right? I mean, he, when somebody just drops something off, you got to have some concern. Is there something bound to these that they're trying to get into your possession? Has that been a concern for you? Exactly. Well, every item that comes into the museum goes to what we call a quarantine period, where we stick it in a room by itself for about two weeks with cameras and, and different types of equipment around it, just to get uh, a baseline of what's happening around it. And nine mm -hmm. times out of ten, nothing happens within this time frame. Uh, we're very honest. Not all the objects we have in the museum have proven their claims. Uh, but, uh, you know, with this, it's going through the quarantine period right now. And then from uh, there, we'll, we'll judge what to do with it. Uh, but, you know, we, we are under the belief that uh, so Tori and myself, uh, we have m m many uh, much different approaches uh, when we're going through this. She takes the more metaphysical route with crystals and sage. I was brought up in a Roman Catholic household, so I, I'm the prayer card type uh, person. Uh, so we both use our own beliefs and kind of meet in the middle, and that seems to work for us. All right. Well, let's get into it. I, I, I usually I like to build up but this time's going to fly by on us and we've got a lot of stories and I'm going to have to have you come back and do even more in the future. But this one, you actually included a video. So let's introduce mm -hmm. who is this, uh, who is this beautiful young lady that uh, you've sent me a photograph of? 
So this is Liza, and actually we're starting off really strong because Liza is the most active item in our collection. Uh, we had gotten Liza from a man in Massachusetts who had contacted us after Cody had done a podcast, and pretty much all that came over the, the phone was make it stop, make it stop. And this man was screaming over and over again. Um, Cody had to calm him down and say, what's going on? And uh, he pretty much said, I hear a voice in my head from this doll named Liza. She's telling me to harm myself and other people. And so mm. a red flag goes off because not only he's in danger, but anybody around him is in danger. So we right. wanted to get him in touch with a psychologist and she gave him, uh, what would you? A, pre a preliminary evaluation. An evaluation. And she said he checked out, you know, he was answering questions okay. He was just explaining that his life was really going downhill. Um, bad things were happening to him and he was having interactions with this doll that were negative. So we said, we don't promote the destruction of items, but why didn't you just throw her out? She was causing you so much trouble. And he said, I did. She keeps coming back. What he meant by that was he had thrown Liza in the dumpster and apparently the garbage person felt compelled to take her out, clean her off and set her back on the porch for him to find uh, a little while later. Coincidence? We're not sure. Um, but we said, OK, we'll meet you in a public location and take this item if you really want us to. And so we did. And he wouldn't tell us where he got this doll from, what happened with this doll before he gave it to us, which makes us wonder, did he take it from somewhere he wasn't supposed to that she wasn't happy about or did he dabble in something? Something he wasn't supposed to um, and it kind of came back on him negatively so we took her and we checked in with him a little while later you know a couple weeks and he said I'm doing great everything's going fine and then we haven't been able to contact him since it's like he never existed um, and since we put her in the museum she has interacted negatively with other dolls so we've had to set her away from the doll section in our museum um, what I mean by that is we put her in the doll section and all their heads would turn um, or their bodies would turn around with them if their heads couldn't turn, so their entire bodies would turn. And this happened about three times until we realized the only difference was Liza added to the mix. And so we put her on a shelf because she just moves around anyway. And uh, ever since then, she just moves around on that shelf all the time, and we get motion detections all the time, just right. like the video. Yeah, we have we have security wow. cameras uh, within our uh, home base, so it's an uh, outbuilding on our property uh, connected to our basement, and. Um, we have caught her moving uh, several times, and uh, uh, we sent you a video of the best clip that we have of her uh, moving. It's pretty self-explanatory. Now, I gotta, guys, I got to be honest with you, all right? Uncle Dave is very nervous when people tell me that I've got a picture of a, a haunted doll moving because I've watched, and I said this to you guys before we get on, I watch all these videos, and it's like you could tell that maybe the sand shifted and it just kind of slumps over. Mm -hmm. uh, or the way they've got it positioned, it just looks like it's just natural, right? Something natural. Mm -hmm. So when I pop on this video, right? I pop on this video, I'm watching your video. <laughs> <laughs> and at first I'm like, huh, did its arm just, holy sh right? And I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Let's, uh, we're going to go ahead and pull this up. I just want to forewarn people that this is exactly what the paranormal couple promised. So this is the doll. Uh, they've got it circled. And for those of you listening, I'm going to put this up on my Facebook as well so that you can find it. But better yet, just go watch the YouTube video of uh, of this episode. And okay, again, maybe something just settled. Maybe the arm just dropped. But then here's the closer look, guys. And when you see this video for yourself the first time, <laughs> it starts lifting up off the shelf. What are your guys' thoughts? Well, it's not something you want to get at 2.30 in the morning on a, on a motion detection. Um, I guess no. if you're looking for something to happen. I guess it's really exciting, but it is a little unnerving to get it at 2.30 in the morning. And the thing is, we, we went down there and tried to explain every way that this doll can move. She's Victorian, so she's stuffed and she's not supposed to move the way she moves, let alone pick herself up and defy gravity. Um, so I guess it was just a really good catch. I mean, it's one of the better ones you've caught. Absolutely. And uh, and that that's the part that gets me is that she's actually going against gravity and lifting herself up. And uh, it's one of the more, more creepiest videos I've ever seen because we're the ones who recorded it. We know there was no fabric <laughs> right. behind it or anything like that. So that's what freaks me out every time I, I watch it. I've seen it hundreds of times now, and I still get the chills watching that. I love uh, Jess Finch says, oh, sweet Lord. Uh, <laughs> where was the other one that made me laugh? I'll tell you, you got uh, Anna Kiel says, oh, there's goosebumps. Uh, Sandy. <laughs> Andy Wolf admits, wow, that's an awesome catch. I want to, what the what was on here as well. <laughs> oh yeah. Wolf Z goes, what the what? Let's, I'm going to play it one more time. Uh, and again, for those of you listening, just go over and watch the YouTube version of it. This thing is 
bonkers. First, the arm kind of looks like it's slapping the other baby doll in the head, right? <laughs> and, and that that its arm starts to move again. I'm thinking, is it settling? But it lifts up. This thing looks as though it's it's getting ready to stand up and climb off your shelf. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. It's crazy. And that's not sped up at all. That's the uh, regular speed. And uh, the way our arm moves that fast, we were, mm-hmm. uh, it was very hard to recreate that as well because, you know, she, she has stuffing in her body. And uh, we thought at first, I thought it just sprung out. Maybe it was caught on her leg or something, uh, but we couldn't recreate that either, which is strange. And what we found is the more attention she gets from people that are saying like, oh, this is creepy or you're the scariest one I've seen. It seems that more activity happens around her. It's almost like she enjoys hearing that. So when we bring her to certain events and investigations and they say something like that, she'll always act up in some way. So um, it's not it's not really negative activity. It's just more like rampant activity. Yeah. You know, you know how I know you're the the daughter of Jason Hawes, because mm-hmm. most people would be showing this video and you'd hear the, I couldn't believe it moved. You're like, this is amazing. There's so much <laughs> just joy, pure joy, pouring off of you. I mean, do you ever do you ever feel nervous though? I mean, for God's sakes, this thing's moving on its own. Do you do you feel like, oh, this is a little scary? Maybe this isn't. Chig says it great. No, thank you. Right. Well, it's not the dark section of the museum. The dark section's a lot more scary, in my opinion, than mm. than this section. So uh, I guess mm-hmm. these are nicer items. So I'm not as nervous. They are. And you know, if if you start getting scared of the items, I mean, we firmly stand our ground when we enter our our museum. We definitely we always preach to our clients. You know, uh, the first step. I mean, we, we don't want your item. That's the first thing. We we want you to try <laughs> the item, and uh, it's the last reason resort to remove the item. We've been nicknamed the foster home for haunted items because we've always given the client the option that if they ever want it back, they can have it back. Uh, But I believe once you start getting afraid of of your objects, maybe you're not uh, in the right field. You know, this definitely isn't for anybody. We're not the only museum. Uh, There's plenty of museums out there and we become friends with a lot of them. uh, And we're definitely not the last and everybody does it different. Uh, But to my Mm -hmm. knowledge, uh, out of the museums uh, that we're friends with, uh, nobody's scared of their items, which which is which uh, says something. Because once you become scared, I think they start taking you over. I've got a garage full of uh, holy bubble wrapped dolls and creepy creatures. <laughs> I'll have to start sending your way because my a my wife is like, get this out of our house. Um, and and I feel bad because they're you know I don't maybe I watch Toy Story too many times. I just feel bad <laughs> that they're wrapped in in bubble wrap with blessings all over them. And uh, they they should live and breathe inside your place, not mine. Uh, sure. Let's talk, yeah, let's talk about this uh, piece now. This is a rosary. It uh, is. What's, yes. the, what's the backstory on this? It's the newest item in our collection. It is. Actually. It is. But it is a very chilling story. And the, and the story behind this is uh, we're going to flash back to 2019 with a mother, a single mother, and her two young children from Alabama. Uh, now, one day, uh, she's. Uh, at her house doing chores, trying to catch up on chores before her kids get home from school off the bus, and in walks her mother, the kid's grandmother. Uh, Now, this isn't odd at all. The grandmother would stop in from time to time. She only lives about 30 minutes away. Uh, But the only strange thing about this day was that it was a Wednesday. And the reason why this is odd is because the grandmother would attend church twice a week, once on Sunday for the regular church service, and once on Wednesday uh, to do her rosary beats. She would go and sit down and uh, say her rosary prayers. Uh, So the reason why it was odd was because she was supposed to be at church this day. So her daughter says, you know, Mom, how come you're not at church today? What are you doing here? And she goes, she holds up the rosary bead and says, uh, you know, I don't think God is going to get mad at me uh, for one day if I miss. I've been going every single week for weeks, and I have a headache today, so I'm, I'm not going. And she says, so they laughed and have a joke. And uh, her daughter explains that, you know, I'm trying to catch up before the kids get off uh, the bus. You know, I have to make lunch for the kids. I have to make a snack and I have to let the dog out to go uh, potty. I have to feed the dog. Uh, And she goes, well, let me help you out. I'll take care of the dog and you work on the kids snack. Uh, So they they catch up and a couple minutes go by and the mother, uh, the daughter, hears the bus coming down the street. Uh, So she says, all right, mom, I'll be right back. I'm going to go get the kids off the bus. Kids get off the bus at the end of the driveway. They start walking back and her cell phone rings. Mm. It's her sister. And her sister says, I've been trying to reach you for the past hour, uh, but your cell phone's been busy. It's a busy signal. How come it's busy? She goes, mom passed away in her sleep last night. And I've been trying to reach you for the past hour. 
So she literally drops her phone and runs into the house. Kids in tow, opens the door, runs into the kitchen where her mother was just taking care of the dog, finds the dog outside in the backyard and finds the food bowl filled with food on the floor and her mother's rosary beads on the counter. How is that possible? So I got nothing for you. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. And so she sent us these rosaries and her exact words were as a reminder and hopefully to show people that when they pass on, it doesn't mean that they're gone. And she thinks it was her mom's way of saying goodbye to her in the easiest way possible before she found out the hard way. So uh, she wanted us to put them in the museum because there's a lot of energy on them. And uh, hopefully it teaches people an important story. Right. And we also at the same time teach about the paranormal. This type of apparition would be called a crisis apparition. And, and many people have experienced this type of phenomena across the globe uh, so at the same time we share a uh, a really heartwarming story at the same time chilling mm -hmm. uh, but also teach a little bit about uh, you know what this type of activity is uh, it's just amazing how rosary beads can literally teleport from 30 minutes away at her house to uh, to her daughter's house it's just, it's just a chilling story but heartwarming I, at the same time I will give you a hundred dollars for those rosaries if it comes with the ghost that'll feed the dog because my kids <laughs> never remember to feed ours. So it'd be great if if grandma could show up and throw a shovel in there for us every morning. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> it's new. Maybe we'll find out the museum's getting cleaned when we're not in it or well, something. Wouldn't it would that be, be awesome? <laughs> it would be very helpful, but it's good energy. Very, very good energy. Yes. Very cool. All right. You say very good energy, and then you send me a picture of something like this. Ooh. This this <laughs> board with feathers tied to it, and it looks like the jaw of a, I don't know. A jaw yeah. of a donkey or something. Uh, what what have we got here, and how did you guys get this piece? So there's many different beliefs about what this piece is, but our best guess um, is it has to do with a form of Baltic witchcraft. Um, this was from the help of a couple people that, of different religions that communicated with us. But um, this piece was found. If you've ever heard of the Bridgewater Triangle area of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm strange things happen. There was a home that borders into Freetown State Forest and they had a uh, trail behind their house. And while the uh, children were back there, they found this statue sitting on a rock facing their house. And mm. um, they didn't really know what it meant, but they were a little freaked out by it. But, you know, kids being kids, they <laughs> wanted to kind of bring it back and they sat it in the garage and some weird things started happening as soon as they brought it in. Right. So unbeknownst to the parents, they had no clue that their kids had just brought this into the house. Uh, right. so they were a Catholic family. They're sitting around the table getting ready for dinner. And every every night before dinner, the father sitting at the head of the table would say a prayer. So he begins the prayer and this tapping starts to happen on all the windows. And it sounds like they described a horse on the roof. They, exactly. Just like that. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> okay. they, they said that it sounded like a horse was galloping on the roof, which, you know, of course, scared all of them. So the mother and father, uh, you know, spring up from the table to head outside to see what's going on. They open up the garage door to head out and they come face to face uh, with this thing. And they slam the door shut and they start, you know, figuring out how it got there. The kids fess up to bringing it inside because they thought it looked cool. And uh, and they avoided the garage. I mean, they were really, uh, you know, hell bent on not go going anywhere near this thing because they thought that this was the cause of whatever just happened. And then a string of paranormal activity and what they claim bad luck fell over them. Uh, doors sounded like they were slamming shut, but remained open. The kids started having nightmares. Uh, whatever entity was around this thing started imitating voices of, of the parents. Uh, the kids would come running downstairs thinking they had been called by their parents. And uh, they would run down there and the parents would just look confused. Uh, so... Definitely a lot of trickery going on. And uh, they'd be laying down in bed at night and they would hear their garage doors opening and closing by themselves where this thing mm. was held. Uh, something that had never happened before, uh, which was strange. So, of course, we got a phone call and uh, and we went and, and picked it up because obviously they didn't want to hold on to this item. Uh, and as soon I, as Let we, me ask you something real quick there. Then. All right. Sure. You know, when you two are together, you you kind of create a new energy, right? And you allow them, yes. do you just go pick it up one at a time so that, and I don't mean this to sound dismissive, right. but I would think like if wonder twin powers are going to make things go <laughs> crazy, maybe just one of us picks it up and brings it back safely till we get it in the quarantine. And then we come in and 
Wonder Twin powers activate and then see what happens. Do you do that singly or do you go together as a couple to pick it up? Uh, so it depends. I mean, usually we do go as a couple. I mean, we found uh, that, you know, when we hold hands, that's when the connection really is uh, the light switch is flipped on. So I don't touch him in public. <laughs> So, um, so when we're together and, and not holding hands, that's, that seems like, uh, you know, everything's normal and, uh, wow. and we really work, we really work well together because, you know, Satori, uh, tends to the family. She's very communicative, uh, with them. She, she talks to people a lot better than I do and has that emotional connection and I handle, uh, removal of, of the items. So where she is sensitive, you are insensitive. Is that what you're trying to tell me? <laughs> I guess so. You can put it that way. <laughs> no, that's, that's amazing. Yeah, but yes, so this, with the symbols, I saw somebody asking me about the symbols um, on the statue. Again, our best guess, uh, we have two different opinions on it. One, that it's more native, um, and another, that it's Baltic witchcraft. And the only reason we're kind of leaning more towards Baltic witchcraft is because the third symbol to the bottom is the symbol of Jumus that I was, I believe that's how it's pronounced by a friend of mine. Um, in Baltic witchcraft, usually means prosperity and, you know, good fortunes when it's upright, but it was upside down in this case, which pretty much means the opposite it sent to whoever or to the land that it was intended for right gotcha. and there is a lot of uh you know activity cult activity within these woods i mean uh if you look up the bridgewater triangle there's a whole right. uh, slew of paranormal stuff going on uh including cults and things like that so um you know it's just strange it's strange we don't believe that it was meant for the family i mean like like satori said this property bordered the freetown state forest where a lot of this cult activity happens so uh i believe it was a ritual that just happened to be uh on their property uh and um and you know they took it home and the cloud kind of followed behind them Jeez, no bueno <laughs> don't pick things up kids if you see something weird and it's ever got the jawbone of an animal leave it alone <laughs> yes <laughs> lessons good advice listen we have time for one more story and again we got to get you guys back maybe around halloween time we'll have you come back and tell us some more creepy stories from the dark we're not even in the dark part of your damn museum we're yet. Not. but no. i think this next piece is going to bring us a little part of that darkness we've got these two marionettes right yes uh, all right go for it so again, it's not necessarily the dark section. We're starting to border the dark section here. Um, it gets a lot worse than this, we promise. Um, but these marionettes came from a home in Ohio, yes. I believe. Yep. And um, they were actually found in the home and they were sold at a local yard sale from this home. And it was new owners that owned it. They found them. They thought they should just sell them at the yard sale. And this person had found them at the yard sale and she thought they were very interesting. So she would take them. There was rumors about this house. Um, there was rumors that the previous owners had actually um, died in the home due to, and I'm sorry for trigger warning for anybody, um, a murder suicide type situation. Mm. Um, but it was, they didn't, she didn't really confirm it for us. Um, we had taken these dolls off her hands cause she said that they started, you know, acting up and giving her bad energy and moving around. So she had sent us these and these aren't the only dolls. There were a couple more with them, but, um, when we had taken them in, they actually in quarantine period really started acting up. We weren't prepared for it. So we hung them up in the quarantine room and uh, a loved one of ours had actually walked into the museum because we told her to watch the museum, but I don't think we instructed right. walking into the quarantine yes. section. Yeah, we were yeah. away at, at an event and, um, and you know, we had a family member come and check in on things. Of course, the security system in the museum, but just to check in on things, make sure there's no leaks happening or anything like that. And uh, she wandered into the, the quarantine room and claimed we got a frantic phone call that uh, the puppets that were hanging on a hook inside the quarantine room swung at her. And you know, she was you know really freaked out and wanted to throw a trash bag over them. And we're like, no, don't do that, don't do that, uh, because that could upset whatever's around them even more. Uh, just you know, leave and and you know, we'll we'll figure it out when we get back. Uh, and they've been they've been pretty active. They just got into the circuit of, of the the traveling exhibition that that we do, and uh, and people have definitely uh, freaked out when they were near them. Yes, we can't confirm any small movements because the thing about these dolls is they swing. They always swing. They're always moving around. The slightest gust of air or wind makes them move like crazy. So it's very hard to prove that. Um, mm. We just kind of take it from that individual who went into the quarantine room. They say that it swung and smacked them, like went up in a swing. Um, and a couple of the people say they felt really uneasy and saw things move, like the heads that don't necessarily swing. Mm -hmm. It is turned. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Um, so we're going off that, but we're still waiting to get evidence and video to show. And the really cool thing is once you visit the exhibition, we have different stations where if you feel something or experience something, you write it down on a piece of paper and put it in the box. It's like a giant case study. And, um, and we found that people that have never met each other before are experiencing the same things when they're around different items. And uh, multiple people that have, you know, viewed the puppets uh, have had very similar uh, feelings. And sadly, we were able to confirm that the previous owners of the house where these dolls were obtained from murder suicide. So these dolls wow. belong to that individual. Um, so mm -hmm. is it them? I'm not sure. Um, is it just energy from that house? We're not sure either. Cody, Satori, it is a pleasure to have you on here. I hope this is just the first of many visits. Again, I'd like to have you back sometime next month around Halloween and we'll get real creepy, uh, bring in some of your weirdest, creepiest, dark element stories. And we'll share those to creep up the holiday season. Again, mm -hmm. how can people find you keep up with where you're going to be your travels and how can they see the museum? Sure. Well, uh, all of our events are listed on the website, paranormalcouple.com or theparanormalcouple.com. It leads to the same place. Uh, if you want to keep up on day-to-day uh, -day things, follow us on Facebook. Uh, we always post some strange things like that post we talked about in the beginning of that package mm -hmm. that showed up. Uh, Facebook page is the Paranormal Couples Haunted Museum. And then you can also find us on TikTok and YouTube. We do a bi-weekly show every Thursday uh, from the museum uh, and we feature a different object every episode. So uh, check us out and uh, thanks for uh, for listening to our spooky stories and thanks for having us on. Thanks for having us. Love it, guys. Take care, be safe, and hopefully we'll bump into each other again real soon at another convention. Sounds All good, right. Dave. Have a good night. See ya. You too. Take care. Amazing stories, creepy stuff going on. Hey, folks, let me remind you, speaking of creepy stories, tomorrow we have the special presentation The Paranormal 60 presents this season on Ghosts of Devil's Perch, Episode 3, Monster in the Mine Recap. K.D. Stafford, the mad scientist of the paranormal, will join me along with a special secret guest. That's tomorrow, same paranormal time, same paranormal channel. Make sure that you don't miss that. Coming up next, though, we've got a good friend of mine joining us. You might recognize her from a little series that was just out on Travel Channel and Discovery Plus, The Ghost Town Terror. You can watch it. It is trending right now on the Discovery Plus app, and it took place in the town directly next to Butte, Montana. As a matter of fact, we were filming both series simultaneously. Our good friend, Sarah Lemos is here. Hello, Sarah. Hi, honey. How you doing? I'm doing great. It's good to see you. And um, it's been a while. I wanted to give you something fun to do. Since we're talking about items that seem to have a life of their own, I wanted to do a movie review tonight. And uh, I sent you back in time to Stephen King's movie, Needful Things. So ladies and gentlemen... It's time now for Upon Further Review. Karen Dahlman will join us in just a few moments. But first, Sarah, let's give the audience a little taste of the cinematic classic that I sent you to watch. Well, this was definitely... Castle Rock Entertainment and Stephen King invite you to visit Castle Rock, Maine a quiet little town whose population has just increased by one. Do you believe in the devil, Father? I guess I have to. We can't have one without the other. What's he look like? What the hell does he look like? May I take this opportunity to welcome you to Castle Rock on the good Lord's behalf? Why not? So where are you from? Ohio. I've been in this business a long time, and I've learned the pleasure of offering my customers what they really need. He came here to destroy us. Oh, you wish it. There have been two murders and an attempted suicide in this quiet little town, and Mr. Leland Gorn is at the bottom of it. You are disgusting. I like that in a person. Everybody that's got it coming is going to get it now. The young carpenter from Nazareth? I knew him well. Promising young man, but he died badly. A famine here, a flood there, a little bloodlash, a broken heart. You can't win. I've got God on my side. Things happen. 
needful things. Now you hadn't seen this movie before, Sarah. No, no. And, and mind you, it's two hours. That's two yes. hours. That movie is a two hour long movie. Okay. It's a commitment to a horror it movie. Sure. <laughs> so, uh, the basics of this. So what the have you basics got for us? is this, this gentleman, if you will, um, comes to town. He starts up a little shop called needful things. His name is Leland and different people from around the city come in to get objects. Um, and he asks for just a little from you. He asks a few dollars here or a few dollars there, but he also asks you to do one favor for him. And that's when this twists and turns and gets a little crazy, a little crazy. A little. So yeah. this is kind of the deal with the devil, right? The monkey's paw with every wish there comes a curse. Yes. Now there's a lot of lot of names in this, right? Uh, Max von Sydow obviously pay, playing the lead in there. You've got Bonnie Bedelia, you've got Ed Harris, so many other great character actors. People are going to recognize from the '80s and '90s. Um, would you call this movie scary, or is it more of like a uh, psychological it's definitely one thriller? One of the psychological thrillers. It's definitely a psychological thriller for sure. <laughs> scary. I'm not sure, but it gets you thinking. It gets you thinking about haunted objects and and objects and where we where we want things so badly that what would we do for them? Mm, very cool. All right. Well, the phantom scale is open. One, this movie sucks. Five phantoms. This is a classic. Where are you going to put Stephen King's Needful Things? You say then you say Stephen King's name. I'm going to say it's definitely a four. I'm going to go with it's a four. That's good. I, I'm sure yeah. everybody would be happy with a four. Yeah. Well, uh, Sarah, I've had a lot of people reach out. They ask me, Dave, can I get a reading from Cindy Kaza from Holzer Files and Ghosts of Devil's Perch? And I say, absolutely not. She's unfortunately, she's so overwhelmed with everything she's got going. Plus she's on the road constantly. She's shut down that part of it. But people always ask me, well, then who do you recommend? And I'm like, my God, I've seen this woman work in person. You did an entire gallery for like 40 people you hit every person in the room in a three-hour span and blew them away so if people are interested in getting a reading are you still doing readings miss tv I celebrity absolutely am absolutely if cool. they're interested they can always check out medium com. all right and you also teach you've got courses you've got cool things that they can that they can uh, come to you for that takes you above and beyond just getting mediumship readings and the stuff you do on tv yeah, so I teach psychometry, mediumship. Um, I walk people through their gifts and um, help them meet their guides. So it's a little bit of everything. Classes are starting actually in this November. All right, very cool. We have a link. We'll put it on today's program guide so everybody can find it as well. Sarah, it's always a pleasure catching up with you. Thanks for stopping by tonight. Thanks for having me. Right. Four, four phantoms. That's pretty remarkable. Pretty remarkable for a classic movie. Joining us now, my friends, somebody I love dearly. She is always great. She's been a guest on many of my different shows, and she's back tonight. Karen Dahlman has one mission for her work, and that one mission is to spread the message that within ourselves is a wellspring of infinite possibilities, which supports the emergence of our greatest self. And I know what you're thinking, but Dave, she's holding the Ouija board. That can't be good. She must be a pure satanic ritual person. No, she's not. Karen Dahlman, welcome back to my program. And it's great to have you here for the first time on the Paranormal 60. Thanks for coming in tonight. You betcha. It's great to be here with you, Dave. And with everybody here in the audience, I'm excited to be here tonight. So thank you so much. Yeah. I, well, I wanted to, I wanted to kind of take a different tact and look obviously we've talked about the ouija board before people simply i can guarantee you there will be people that are signing off just because they can see ouija boards behind you or we're about to talk about ouija boards and i always think i want to re-empower people so that they they don't live in a place of fear when it comes to this but you know ouija boards they, they can obviously be a very powerful conduit to communication to the other side is there something natural about these or or preternatural about these boards themselves when you just get it home is there already kind of a, a spirit attached is there a spirit of ouija if if that makes sense that's already out there as part of this universal plug-in they just need you to open up and put that planchette down mm. and make the connection 
So instead of coming with batteries, it comes with the spirit. Is that what you're asking? Right. Okay, right. Yeah, it. I'm wondering. Yeah. Um, yeah. I love having this conversation, Dave. We've we've had this before, and I, you know, I see a, this. This is just a tool, you guys. I have so many Ouija boards behind me. I have like I think about 85. You can only see a mm. small piece of my a big, uh, I can't, a display. I would call it a display. Of right. three up. I'm surrounded by boards. You guys, I have them everywhere around my house. I bring them with me where I go places. They are just a tool. All right. I saw mm -hmm. somebody earlier talk about intentions when you were talking to the other guests about what mm -hmm. happened with some of the things they have. It's all about the intention. So I would say the board comes with nothing but you with your intentions. So let's say the intentions is basically the batteries, if you will, or the spirit of the board, if that makes sense. Sure, it does. And mm -hmm. I'm fascinated because like I, when I go paranormal investigate, I have a set of tools that mm -hmm. I bring. I might have two or three recorders, but it's kind of stupid because I only use one. <laughs> I have, you know, I, I have I have the one or two things, but I'm, I'm curious, do you feel like the the boards seem to take on a life of their own, like a sentience. I sometimes feel like I've made this kind of spiritual connection. I know this sounds nuts with my recorder or with one of my tools. Like it, it's more than just a, a piece of equipment. It's, it's completing a circuit. Do you think that boards themselves take on a, a consciousness, a life? Well, maybe you are the circuit board yourself. Let's, let's mm -hmm. talk on those, that analogy. You are the circuit board. And when you use a tool, that's what turns it on, not the tool itself. Um, it, it, of course, you know, your, your, your recorder's got to have batteries or what, you know, something to plug to make them work. But a board doesn't need that. The board just needs you. You become the circuit. You become the conduit. I call myself a walk-in Ouija because it's really me who's doing the channeling. The board mm -hmm. does nothing. All my boards, I get them from all over the place, you guys. I get them made for me. I, I buy them on auction. Uh, they're sent to me. I've been, been around boards that are supposedly haunted boards. And I can use any board. And guess what I can get? the exact same kind of messages, no matter what board I'm on. So I see myself as the circuit, as the battery, as the conduit, as the channel. Using a Ouija board is no different than using any other tool, although it might be old school. There's no batteries. I am the battery that makes it work. Uh, but, I, I, but I like to, when I go on investigations, Dave, and I'm getting ready to do a big one in October, I like to bring a board. But I really like to use myself because I'm the one that's sensing and feeling and doing my own kind of psychical work. But I like to do it next to new school because it's interesting what you can get with new school, with old school together. And you may get some very interesting phenomenon. I really feel like I'm the one that brings the messages forth, but I'm the one that's doing the tapping into the other dimensions. So it's my okay. abilities using this tool to bring out my own proclivities, abilities, and what I can do with the board, basically mm -hmm. what I see happening. And like you said, you do build a repertoire or an excitement around a certain tool. And it's right. not so much the tool, it's yourself. And so you even feel like you can use it even better. And for me, I like, I haven't met a board I haven't liked. <laughs> I will sit down with any board and use them because I mm -hmm. really enjoy about the board myself. I enjoy the rich artwork and the history that's part of the boards. And so that in itself makes me get excited. doesn't matter who made the board, if it was homemade. I like the story behind it. I like the just the imagery or just the fact you can use it and work with the unseen dimensions. You, you answered this, but I want to kind of yeah. reframe the question. Does each board have a capability of, of a different style of communication? You say you get these boards from all over. Well, if I've had my board for 40 years and I use it to communicate with my grandmother and I turn that board over to you, Obviously, my intention with this board for 40 years was communicating with my grandmother. Do you ever put your hands down on it and open it up and grandma comes through and you didn't even know it? And all of a sudden you're like, oh, I've got not <laughs> the spirit it? of the board, but it's like mm -hmm. grandma goes to, you know, pick up the cell phone and you've got, you know, now she's connected to Karen Dahlman instead of Dave Schrader. Does that make sense when it comes to Absolutely makes sense. And I think the people have experiences that support what you're saying. I've heard stories mm -hmm. like that for myself. I think it's because I, I'm, I'm a strong medium, a strong channel myself that it's usually up to me and the connection I can make. So if somebody mm -hmm. gives me their board and says, you know, I use this to talk to my grandmother, I would say, well, are you, do you give me permission to try to talk to her? 
Now she gets to choose if she wants to come in. There's always free will at play here. I can never force some energy to come, come through or force energy that you think may be attached to it. It's really still that free will. So I would open it up and say, you know, let's welcome your grandmother if, if that's what you want to do and communicate. And I've done such things like that before. But it, the, the grandmother comes through not so much because of the board, but because that was her tie to this person who's communicating with grandmother. And they go, oh, well, this, this child or this grandson wants to still talk to her. Maybe that's the best way for me to come through to him because that's the only way he accepts me to come through. What mm -hmm. I find when people transition, I don't like to say dead because I love what your other guests said. There's so much more to what meets the eye that they, the spirit continues on. I 100% believe that. Too many experiences to sh tell me differently. So they continue on. I call them transition just because I'm saying, okay, knock, knock. Will you come through? They, I've had a lot of different spirits tell me it's really time for me to come to this person directly so they can have a belief now that I'm still here. And like, mm -hmm. I might get in the way or hinder that in some, some form of way. But some people say, I give you permission to reach this person and they still choose that they want to come through. So, it, you know, it's a, it's a toss up sometimes, but just because they worked with that board doesn't mean they're going to come through. Now I have a lot of boards. I have my oldest boards in 1892 circuit board. Mm. Um, and it's actually this one back here. I have, oh, yeah. okay. I can see right there. Yeah. I got so many boards you guys around me. I'm not sure what yeah. you can see. Yeah. Um, and so I haven't had like weird things or different people coming through. Um, but it's one of my favorite boards. You know, I, I use it for who I always talk to, which is the spirit beings. I call the guides. Um, so yeah, you can see a lot of different boards now. That's like a 1902 back here. I've got some 40 boards. Here's my original board. You guys, this came from Santa Claus, 1973. One of my favorite boards here is this big one, 1950. I think you mean Satan Claus. Yeah. That guy Santa right would there. never deliver a Ouija board. No, th here, you'll love this story, Dave and you guys. So I received that board back there, uh, December 25th, 1973, December 26th, 1973, the movie, the Exorcist came out. So it's kind of a neat little story there. Well, especially because we can really kind of track to the moment the world flipped on Ouija board was what this, that, that was in the movie. Was it like 38 seconds? And that's, that's exactly right. And it was in the book, of course, too, which came out two right. years earlier, but seeing it on the big screen uh, and it was only like, yeah, 40 seconds about that much. And that was it, but it was enough for, for that. People say, Oh no, you guys, you got to understand at that time, Parker brothers was selling the boards. It was their best selling game. And they're called games they are sold as games. You guys, I don't right. think they are, but they're sold as games. It was their highest selling game that outsold monopoly. The first year it went into business with Parker brothers. So it was yeah. almost pretty much in everybody's closets or attics or basements. Everybody was using them. All right. I, I'd like your input on this because I'm sure there are people around the world watching this video right now, listening to this audio podcast from the safety of their homes. Yep. And they're remembering their first experience. I want everybody to kind of close your eyes, unless you're driving your car and listening. Don't, don't do that. Keep them open. But I want you to put yourself back to that first time you used a Ouija board. Most of us were at some kind of party, either, uh, uh, well, for the guys, very rarely did we have an all guys party where we played with Ouija boards. We usually brought it out when we had the the boy girl parties because yeah, let's maybe move that planchette. So Karen will snuggle a little closer if things get creepy, right? That was the hopes. That was the, right. that's what the guys were hoping for. And I remember we were at Shannon Hoffman's house over in <laughs> Itasca, Illinois, and we were, we broke out the Ouija board and we're all playing the Ouija board after already doing a freaky session of stiff as a board, light as a feather, uh, mm. that totally unnerved me. And still to this day as an almost 55 year old man, uh, 40 years later, I'm still like, what the hell happened in that? You could tell me it's physics, Dave. It's not when there's just eight teenagers with the fingertips lifting a human off the ground. That's not physics. It's black magic. But then we broke out the Ouija board <laughs> and we started getting messages and the girls got freaked out and it was exactly what we all hoped for. And they were, oh, cuddle up. Oh, As we're talking, we all decided we're going to stop now. We're going to stop and we push away. And the board's on the table and the planchette is on the table and it's a flat surface. And we've all got our arms around our girls. We're like, baby, it's okay. We're here for you. Nothing's going to go wrong. And Karen, my hand to the sky, the planchette shook and slid mm. off the table by itself. Now, is that... In your opinion, is that the spirits having a little fun with us or is it 
the sexual tension of eight <laughs> to ten teenagers vibing on this board that this board was just charred with energy. Uh, where do you think this lies? Or was it a demon? You know, the thing is this, we really don't know. So I can try to sound old, you know, official and say this is what it was. Well, but you've worked with it for but, enough But I am time. a psychotherapist. Yeah. I am a psychotherapist. Yeah. I mean, you know that. Oh, okay. God, I'm being analyzed. I know. Right. So I'm going to tell you what's wrong with you, okay? <laughs> okay. Jeez, I don't that's think we've got enough started, time. Guys. For Dave, uh -huh. that's where yeah. it all started. Okay. So listen, why why do we give so much energy and attribution to an inanimate object? Could it have been psychokinesis? Could it have been that sexual charged energy? Could have been pubescence. They, I mean, they say a lot of times younger women growing into pubescence is actually causing poltergeist. There's studies on that. So it could have been a number of things. And it could have been maybe a trickster. But I kind of think it could be our own. We want something to happen. And so maybe there's this telepathic and then a psychokinesis thing making things happen. I mean, there's so much we haven't quite I can't say we, we explore it. We can't quite put our finger on it. A and maybe we are really all connected at some great metrics, a matrix level of energy that we have our, you know, we're excited about something. We make something happen. You know, I saw the dolls move. I've seen that stuff before in person. I've seen it on video. You know, is that us making it happen or is it actually a spirit? You know, you, we don't really know, but I would say, Dave, your guess is as good as mine, but I, I'm going to tend to go with the thing that maybe our minds are so much more powerful than, than we think we are, or we, than we think they are, and also that we're just not a pawn to our environment. I believe spiritually, metaphysically, that we help co-create our environment, so we're always co-crafting our experiences in life. Therefore, there could have been an aspect of that involved, too. All right. Interesting elements. Yeah. And I will tell you folks, again, it's the intent. We usually go in with the intent to get that little thrill, to get that scare. And I think the spirits know that. And I've, I've talked to Jeff Belanger and Shane Pittman. We've all kind of made this death pact that when we go, we are definitely going to be the ghosts pushing the planchette to you're going to die or pointing the planchette at okay. you when you ask who's going to die. Cause that to us is going to be ragingly funny. Right? Yeah. So that's, that's part of it. I do believe that that is what happens. And if you set the intention to be frightened, I think the ghosts are willing to play along with you. I think they're willing to, to realize what you're really there to do, but you have, have worked with the boards for, for years. Well, 49 had, years, 49 yeah, years right now this summer. Yeah. Right. Remarkable aspects and communication with it. Courtney Williams asks, can we talk about the automatic mm. writing at the Borden house, Dave? No, That's we cool. can't because I already <laughs> talked about that. Just scroll back in our timeline and find the curse of Lizzie Borden episode. We did just like this. And you can watch Chris Fleming, Sam Beltrusis, and I talk about it. We go in depth. I don't want to take away from Karen's time to talk about automatic writing in this case that happened to me, but mm -hmm. I do think it's fascinating. The concept, again, the fragility of, of humans, we forget how powerful we truly are. And yes, we, we, we want do. to ascribe, we want to ascribe power to, to an outside force. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's kind of examining the boards in a way that they're living, breathing characters or, you know, or is it an aspect, an element of us that we leave with these boards? Is it, is it your, you, you mentioned it so well, you know, you're the core element of the Ouija board. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that it's your knowledge, but you become the conduit for the board to work, right? You're right. the board, the board is a radio sitting there with the dial on it. And then you're the the plug that turns the radio on and allows the vocalizations of the universe and spirit to be pushed out and read for everybody to see. Is that a fair assessment? Well, let me shift that a little bit. I like what you're, I like where you're going with this analogy. I feel like I am the radio. I'm the transmitter and receiver. I tune mm -hmm. myself through my intentions with this inanimate object behind me, you guys see, to allow the messages to flow through. You take the board away, Dave. This is what I want to say. You take the board away from me now. Now I'm channeling the same messages off the board directly or let's talk about automatic writing through automatism whether it's automatic writing journaling or the hand moving which is what it does with the planchette so this whole element of letting go to allow this stuff to come through so i would say it's an automatic thing it's an automatism you want to i like to use that word instead and i am really tuning myself through the intentions again dave to get that to receive that signal to send my signal out to receive it and that's what allows this the, the planchette to move. It allows the messages to come. It's ourselves, you guys. I want everybody to be really clear about this. It's yourself as the operator. It's like you're driving a car. 
but instead you're driving the planchette and it's, you let go and this automatic movement happens where I'm not pushing it consciously, but something's happening here and I'm getting messages. There's no way I would have known. So I believe it's myself merging with this other energy through my intentions I set. So, you know, Dave, I've talked about this before in your shows, I get nothing but positive stuff because that's really what I'm searching for. I'm searching to help people grow, evolve spiritually, metaphysically, understand the supernatural, maybe have some relief from grief from somebody who transitioned. So it's a very, I call it Ouija therapy, you guys. I, you know, that's what I do. I'm a Ouija therapist, okay? So it's like I'm helping people use this tool to even explore their, their innermost thoughts, like their inner self, their larger self, their right. higher self, right? So I use it for these reasons. And that's why, you guys, I'm always going to get positive responses when I use them. I, uh, I love talking to you about these things and, and for season two of the Holzer files, um, they were very respectful to Cindy, Shane, and myself. They allowed us mm -hmm. to come up with experiments and do things. And I said, I have an experiment that I want to do. That's going to piss off all the viewers immediately yeah. upon seeing it, but I need to talk to somebody. And I called Robert Murch, Bob Murch, you know, who's really kind of the Ouija historian. That's how the world kind of looks at this guy. And uh, I just saw my power is going to go. So I'm going to keep talking while I replug in here. Okay. But <laughs> what I got, sorry, I got a, a, apparently one of my animals ran through here earlier, knocking my pin it out. Happens. Yeah. Um, so I said, I want to bring a Ouija board in to uh, Franklin Castle in Ohio because mm -hmm. um, people have talked about the fact that they used Ouija boards, that it was a, a dorm for a while and college students would stay there. They would open up sessions with the board. And I, I said, you know, Bob, do you think we can close these sessions? And he goes, Dave, I don't know. I still don't believe ghosts are communicating to us through the board. Talk to Karen Dahlman. This is her realm. This is where, and I love that about Bob. He loves Ouija boards, mm -hmm. fascinated by him, but he's the first to tell you, I don't necessarily believe it's a ghost that's talking to you. So I called you and I, I, I was like, I, I don't want you to think I'm being an idiot. I'm not trying to horn in on anybody's, you know, kind of way of thinking. But my, my goal here is that I want to take this board into the room where all of these experiments happened. I want to use the infinity symbol as our imagery. Mm -hmm. So we're going to put our fingers on the planchette, Karen, and I want to call forth all the spirits that have been called in through the Ouija board, all of the, and I want to try to put them back, put them back where they belong, let them go, free them from this area. Will that work? And I remember you said, Dave, that is such a beautiful concept mm -hmm. and your intention behind it is what's going to make it work. But the board will be a great visualization for mm -hmm. people to see. And you're right. It's how we perceive if we can use this tool as a healing method. And that's, that's how I took it to the producers. And they're like, all right. You don't think we're going <laughs> to piss off everybody? I'm like, yes, we are, but I want to. I want to give them a bait and switch. I want them to see, are these morons really going to use a Ouija board on TV and ghost hunt with it? And I knew that that was going to be the anger and ire. And I was right at first because I was watching the live tweets that night. And then mm -hmm. when we used it to close things down, people were really kind of thrown by that fact that we did something different with the board, not calling mm -hmm. the spirits out from the ether, but calling the spirits that were left behind to go back where they belong. That, that we're sorry that the people that came before us didn't properly close down their session. And a lot of people will say, that's so stupid, the whole session, the opening and the closing ceremonies uh, of, a, of that. What are your thoughts regarding that? I mean, most kids bring it out, ask some questions, yeah, it right. moves, they put it away. Have they left a door open to the other side truthfully? Um, not knowing, again, if their intention was not to open a door and leave it open, is that still taking place? Well, a couple of things I want to say. First, I want to say what you did on, on TV that time was a, was a beautiful ritual. And I want to say when, ritual is a good word to use here when you use any kind of tools, when you do any kind of unseen dimensional work, whether you're going to step into a place and you're going to use the, your EVPs or your Frank box or whatever, Rin Pods, whatever you're going to use, okay? I do the same thing. And I think a ritual is your way to step into some space sacred, some mm -hmm. space where you want to set your intentions. So I think that's really important for the whole process to have some kind of opening middle place and an ending which would be a closing so i started the age of eight dave i didn't know what i was doing all right i just got the mm -hmm. box of the board in the box and i read the back of the box it said sit down preferably male female so i got my younger brother to work the board with me i thought you had to have a guy with you <laughs> so, until i don't know, several years later but i followed that little ritual they had and i but i took it seriously 
So I think when you're messing around, no matter what age you are, and you're playing around with this tool, you know, you might pull in something there. I mean, there's energies out there. I've, I talk to them all the time. They're out there. People experience them. You're seeing them. Those videos you saw earlier, there's stuff going on. We can't quite explain. So it's yeah. out there. So I think if you can, if anybody wants to use this tool, by the way, I'm not here to tell people to go use the board. I love the board. It's my, it's my tool. Okay. But I think it'd be a beautiful tool to use, but I say always have some ritual around it. That is why Dave, I loved your idea. You took this show. You were doing this figure eight, which is like really a beautiful, soothing infinity symbol. It's actually a very nice symbol. And sometimes the spirits come through the board that way. And you, instead of opening it up, you're saying, you know what? Thank you for being here. Your time is done and you can move forward. You're saying we're letting go of you. So you have some ritual process, you guys, going into the session when you use it, and then when you end it. Now, people say to me, Dave, do you have to say goodbye? Look, tonight, I'm not going to go click. I'm going to say, bye, you guys. It's so great being here, you know, because it really is truly a joy to be here with everybody. It's having an etiquette. When you have an etiquette about something, again, it makes it more serious in a nature, and then you get more serious results. So I highly recommend anybody's going to use this tool or throw cards, the I Ching, the ruins, the dowsing rods, any of these tools that work with the, you could call it a weird energy. You're not sure what it is. If you have some kind of process that's respectful, that's setting your intentions. You're going to most likely get something that's respectful back. So you got to find the way you do it. I don't necessarily have a goodbye. My planchette never goes to goodbye. If you watch me use the board, it just never has. It just stops. And I just say goodbye. So we really got to figure this out yourself, how you want to work it, but keep it in a ritualistic way. And that's going to be the best way to work with this tool. Karen Dahlman, you are a treat and a treasure. Thank you for coming on and for enlightening and educating people. And how can they reach out to you if they'd like to know more? And if they'd like to, to join the Talking Board Historical Society, what's the best yep. way to reach you? Yeah, thank you so much, Dave. I really appreciate coming on the show tonight. And everybody, thank you for contributing in the chat room. Um, you can find me anywhere under Karen A. Dahlman on social media. Join my YouTube channel, Karen A. Dahlman, my name below right there, KarenADahlman.com and TBHS tbhs.org to learn more about the Talking Board Historical Society. We are a nonprofit organization. If you give money or buy our t-shirts such as this, we take that money. We do really cool things in the public to educate about the true history of Ouija boards. So thank you guys. And here I am saying goodbye. <laughs> Bye, you guys. Thank you so much for having me tonight, Dave. Appreciate it. Thank you, Karen. There is a link for Karen in tonight's program guide so you can find her and find more information. Hey, folks, Ghosts of Devil's Perch, new episodes every Sunday on Travel Channel and Discovery+. Plus. If you missed it this past Sunday, get on it. Watch it right away because we need those ratings. Need your eyes on it. So if you've got Discovery Plus, watch it now. If you T-vote it or DVR'd it on travel, watch it within that first 48-hour span so that your views count and your favorite shows can stay on the air. We'll be back tomorrow night with the Paranormal 60 Presents. It's a special bonus edition of our show. During the run of Ghosts of Devil's Perch, we will do a recap episode every week. And Katie Stafford, my guest tomorrow night, along with a very special guest you guys are going to want to tune in for as we review Monster in the Mine. That is the next aspect of the story that we'll be covering. Souvenirs of our journey through life, well, that's expected. But pay attention to how much you give of yourself to material objects. You desire things. You desire to have things. But maybe the things desire your attention as well. When all is said and done, don't leave more of yourself behind with objects. Pour that attention into the people that you care for most. Because living on forever inside of their hearts is much better than being tied to your vehicle, your creepy doll, your jewelry, or items that just may one day be discarded. And be careful. The next time you hit up those garage sales and flea markets, you never know. That bargain you gained may be more than you bargained for. I'd like to thank our guests this evening, Cody, Ray, Despian, and Satori Hawes for sharing their experiences and insights, and to my wonderful friend, Karen Dahlman, for her always interesting and well-spoken theories and beliefs, and again, to the amazing medium, Sarah Lemos, for her friendship and the smiles that she always brings to everybody that meets her. Thank you all for joining my journey and visiting the Paranormal 60, taking me along on your journey. And may the darkness be just a little more light with the information that we share here. 
Make sure to like this video and podcast, subscribe, tell everybody you know about it, and do me a favor, rate and review, especially those of you on um, the Apple Tunes or iTunes, whatever it is, please go out and, and put it on there. And also on Amazon Music and Audible, make sure that you rate and review on those as well. That's right. You can find us on Audible. So if you're an Audible person, make sure you check that out. And uh, please rate and review. It does go a long way. Give us those five stars. Write a little review. Tell people why you gave us five stars. I see that we've got a lot of great ratings, but very few have actually taken the time to just say, because Dave's amazing. That's all you have to write, or maybe what you really feel in your heart. But I want to thank you all for being a part of our world and for being here with us this evening on the show. We'll be back again tomorrow with our special bonus episode and this Friday with the Paranormal 60 News. Until then, I'm Dave Schrader.